So welcome to our second panel. I am Richard McAdams uh, of the University of Chicago Law School. And I'm, I'm very excited to be uh, moderating uh, this panel on policing and prospects of reform with a truly outstanding uh, set of speakers, uh, Elise uh, Body, Robert Vargas, and Wes Gogan. Um, I will now introduce uh, the first speaker and I'll introduce the second or third speakers later. Um, Elise Body is the Henry Rutgers Professor of Law at the Rutgers Law School, and also the Robert L. Carter Scholar and the founding Newark Director of Rutgers University Institute <clears throat> for the study of global racial justice. Her scholarship uh, explores the regulation of race in spatial context and dynamic systems that perpetuate racial equality. And one of her um, many uh, articles, uh, Racial Territoriality, won the John Hope Franklin Prize from the Law and Society Association. Uh, she will speak to us uh, about territorial policing in black neighborhoods. Professor. Body. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you today. Thank you to the editors of the Law Review and to professors um, Aziz Hook and uh, John Rappaport, as well as um, Professor McAdams for moderating this event. Um, so I, as uh, uh, Professor McAdams mentioned, I'm going to be speaking with you today about racially territorial policing. Um, in black neighborhood spaces. Um, can everyone see okay? And if not, can someone just shout out that there's a problem with my video? Okay, hearing no objections. Um, so uh, the focus of my presentation today is going to uh, focus on how Fourth Amendment doctrine in uh, the Supreme Court's 2000 decision of Illinois versus Wardlow facilitates racially territorial policing, which I'll define in just a moment, um, throughout black neighborhoods by granting police broad discretion to designate high crime area, areas, uh, which limits or micromanages black mobility. I'm focusing very intentionally on black spaces, but the same kind of analysis could apply to other, other kinds of spaces as well, other racially identifiable spaces as well. Um, so first, what is uh, racial territoriality? Um, I define it as a spatial system of racial control, either through domination or exclusion. Um, that's based on racialized perceptions about where people either do or do not belong according to their race. Um, it's, in, it's important in thinking about the significance of racial territoriality to um, understand the centrality of spatial processes to the exercise of racial power and hierarchy throughout our history. Um, so here I'm referring to uh, the Black Codes, uh, anti-vagrancy laws, Jim Crow, segregation, redlining, I have a picture of a redline Chicago to the left, um, and urban renewal. Um, my, my point here being that the subjugation of black space limits the freedom of black people to move about, which denies them equality and liberty and the expression of their full humanity. Um, it also denies them the benefits of just ordinariness, right? The ability to just be in a, in a way that is unstigmatized and, and denigrated. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about why this frame uh, matters in the conversation for today. Um, so the significance of racial territoriality um, is that it shifts law and policy to focus not only on the interactions between individuals, for example, police and residents, um, but also to consider how the spatial context for those interactions um, has an influencing dynamic. Um, when we evaluate uh, racial territoriality, we look not only to the, the racial attributes of space, that is um, whether it's associated with uh, black people or other racial and ethnic groups, but also its racial meaning. So for example, uh, we tend to identify black space as poor, uh, disorderly, or especially in the context of policing, uh, criminal space. And I have all of that in quotes. Um, 
Okay, so turning to Illinois versus Wardlow itself, um, I wanted to um, uh, talk a little bit about the facts of the case. And in, in particular, I wanna focus on the significance of mobility and space in the case. Um, so in Wardlow, we had two officers uh, who were working as uh, uniformed officers um, in the Chicago Police Department. They're driving through a Chicago area, which is, and I have this in bold, um, which is an area, quote unquote, known for heavy narcotics trafficking uh, to investigate drug transactions. Um, and they were looking supposedly, as they assert, uh, for a crowd of people in the area, um, including lookouts and customers. Um, and as they passed this particular uh, street, um, one of the officers uh, sees uh, Mr. Wardlow standing next to a building holding an opaque bag. Um, Mr. Wardlow looks in the direction of the officers and he flees. Um, the officers then turn their car around, uh, they run through uh, an alley, they eventually corner him in a street. Um, uh, Mr. Nolan, Officer Nolan gets out of the car and stops Mr. Wardlow. And then he conducts a protective pat down search for weapons uh, because, and here's what's important, in his experience, it was common for there to be weapons in the near vicinity of narcotics transactions. Um, the officer uh, squeezes the bag, feels the bag that uh, Mr. Wardlow is carrying and feels a heavy hard object similar to the shape of a gun. He opens the bag and he discovers the gun and then he is arrested. Um, the part of the uh, majority opinion, uh, what, what the majority opinion leaves out um, are a couple of sort of key facts which were emphasized in a brief that was an amicus brief that was filed uh, by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, first of all, it was late morning, um, not, it was not dark or it was not in the, uh, the evening, the nighttime. Um, the officers were not responding to a report or tip of criminal activity. Um, they were not searching for a particular suspect. Um, Mr. Wardlow was a middle-aged African-American male, um, which is not mentioned in the opinion. Officer Nolan did not know Wardlow. He was not, and Wardlow was not violating any law or regulation at the time. Um, and when he chased Mr. Wardlow, he did not identify himself or command Mr. Wardlow to, to stop. And prior to catching Mr. Wardlow, he did not see um, Mr. Wardlow make any efforts, effort to conceal or to hide anything. Um, so as many of you uh, probably already know, in Illinois versus Wardlow, the court held that a person's presence in an area of expected criminal activity alone is not sufficient to justify a Terry stop, um, but the fact that the stop occurred in a high crime area is among the relevant contextual considerations in a Terry analysis. Um, and so what we have in, um, in the decision are, uh, is sort of aspects of racial territoriality. Um, we have what the court describes as unprovoked flight, of course, um, as we know, in a high crime area, which I uh, reinterpret to refer to unjustified moment movement, um, that is limitations on black mobility in a guilty space, right? The high crime area as a guilty space. Um, I think it's worth noting the dissent here. Um, so there are so two aspects of the dissent that I want to emphasize. One is the dissent's um, sort of re-characterization of unprovoked flight. Um, and essentially what they say is there are entirely innocent explanations for unprovoked flight. Um, uh, many folks uh, in uh, predominantly black areas believe that justifiably uh, that contact with the police can be dangerous, um, apart from any criminal activity associated with the officer's presence. And for, and for a person um, who lives um, in a predominantly black neighborhood, uh, this sort of running from the police is neither aberrant uh, nor abnormal. Um, as to the dissent's focus on high crime area, um, the, the uh, dissent says, you know, even if the assumption is um, accurate uh, that the flight occurred in a high crime area, um, it is insufficient because even in a high crime neighborhood, unprovoked flight does not invariably lead to reasonable suspicion. Um, 
Again, there are many factors that could uh, provide innocent motivations for unprovoked flight in uh, high crime areas. Um, and the uh, dissent interestingly notes that the character of the neighborhood um, arguably makes an inference of guilt less appropriate rather than more so. Um, so then again, there are you know, innocent uh, explanations um, here and therefore there's some reason to question the basis for reasonable suspicion. Okay, so um, here I wanna sort of look more closely at um, the sort of the, the the premise of the Wardlow decision. Um, and I'm relying here on a terrific article, uh, law review article by Ben uh, Grunwald and Jeffrey Fagan um, that was published in the California Law Review a couple of years ago, the end of intuition-based high crime areas. Um, and there are three, uh, Grunwald and Fagan argue, unspoken empirical assumptions in Wardlow. Um, the first is that um, high crime area uh, should be analyzed through a more granular lens, that is, you know, a, a smaller geographic unit. Um, the second um, unspoken empirical assumption is that an officer's assessment of high crime areas um, is relatively accurate. And then the third is that officers' identification of areas as high crime um, should predict whether suspects are engaged in crime um, to satisfy the reasonable suspicion standard. Um, but as uh, uh, Grunwald and Dr. Fagan show um, that these assumptions are uh, not justified based on uh, the data, um, research that was conducted on nearly 2.5 million stops uh, by the New York Police Department between uh, the years 2007 and 2012, which was a time of concentrated stop and frisk activity um, in New York City. And what they find is, is, is really um, powerful, right? Um, so what, the, what they concluded is that the implementation of the high crime area standard um, in New York City during this period um, appears haphazard at best and discriminatory at worst. Um, that essentially the police indiscriminately used um, uh, the high crime area designation um, across New York City. They noted that um, you know, every block in the city at one point or another had been identified as high crime. They also noted um, that the racial composition of the area and the identity of the officer were stronger predictors of whether the officer deemed an area to be high crime. Uh, that was more predictive than the actual crime rate itself. Um, and then they finally noted that there was a possibility that the high crime area designations were in fact a cover to bolster the appearance of constitutional validity um, in their weakest, i.e. Uh, most unjustified stops. Um, so now I want to return to the notion of um, territoriality um, and to sort of discuss the territorial harms um, in Wardlow. Um, and the harms of Wardlow is that it enables the police to function not only as agents of racially unjust and ineffective criminal justice policies, again, referencing um, Grunewald and Fagan's research here, um, uh, and these criminal justice policies don't only harm individuals, but it also reproduces and entrenches the spatial subordination of black people in black communities. Um, and here it's important to note um, some uh, research that has been conducted by sociologists who talk about um, the police as sort of not only responding to spatial environment, but also co-creating it. Um, as police, uh, Donica Nort Gordon notes in her uh, piece, the, places, the police as place consolidators, um, police regulate the kinds of police people and activities found in particular areas. Um, and as they do so, they, they produce and reproduce understandings of how orderly, secure, dangerous, or criminal discrete geographies can be. So in addition to responding to the environment, organizational activities um, actively construct it. So when we have, again, returning to the research I, by uh, Grunewald and Fagan, right, when basically an entire um, uh, section 
uh, an entire geographic area is designated as high crime, when that area is identifiably black, what we have is policing that emerges as a racially territorial spatial system, right, through stop and frisk, through the, um, uh, the heavy repeated identification of black people as suspect, um, that those policing processes reinforce racial territoriality, um, as well as uh, spatial isolation and segregation itself. Um, and so uh, what I argue is that the overly broad designations of high crime areas um, stigmatize black space. Um, it stigmatizes black space as criminal space of the presumptively perennially guilty and the suspect um, and therefore, because this is this space is stigmatized as criminal, guilty, and suspect, it is justifiably territorialized by being dominated, contained, and subjugated um, by the state. Um, so, just to dr drill down a little bit further on how farther on how racially territorial policing um, produces and reinforces black and white space. Um, and here I'm drawing on work by Martha Mahoney, who, who is, is a very uh, prominent scholar who writes about uh, the racialized impacts of segregation. Um, and so what I argue here is that racially territorial policing maps notions, spatializes notions of black inferiority and white superiority onto neighborhood spaces through processes of marginalization, exclusion and concentration, um, these processes in turn produce and reinforce the respective blackness and whiteness of these spaces, which are then perceived as both natural and inevitable, right? That's just the way things are, right? Racially identifiable black and white spaces. Um, I wanted, I have this relatively long quote here, which I, I'm not going to read because I want to be sensitive about time. Um, but the but the criminal justice system um, fails to really interrogate uh, the notion of high crime areas. Uh, I've, ar I've already talked about how um, policing um, constructs and reinforces the notion of criminality in black spaces. Um, this is a really interesting piece by a former assistant US attorney who talked about her experiences um, in court um, dealing with uh, defendants who were um, sort of accused of various um, crimes. And one of the things that she said was just how notable it was that the phrase high crime area was just readily accepted, um, not only by the law enforcement officers, but by uh, the defense counsel as well, and uh, even um, the judge. Um, and she notes, rarely did law enforcement officers explain um, why these areas were classified as inherently dangerous, deadly, or lawless. Um, she would often question police officers about this characterization before going to court. Um, judges really rarely challenged uh, the label or required its uh, any sort of definition. Um, and never asked officers for data to support their assertions that an area was, was high crime. Um, and she says, um, again, even defense counsel seemed to accept this characterization um, and uh, never challenged or rarely challenged the way uh, that these labels were applied. Um, everyone sort of just defers to the notion that the jurisdictions, quote unquote, mean streets should absolve the police for their questionable uh, law enforcement tactics. Um, so the harms of, uh, of racially territorial policing, um, I talked a little bit about the spatial harms, but just also the individual harms, right? There's the, the stigma um, of the experiencing oneself as a perpetual suspect. And I've referred to already the loss of ordinariness that that entails, the ability to just live one's life as an ordinary system, sort of unmolested, um, the dignity of just being, of just being able to be. Um, in one space. I've also mentioned the loss of mobility, right? The loss of freedom to move about a particular space, the obvious loss of privacy, the loss of citizenship and belonging. Um, Tracy Mears also talks about procedural injustice associated with um, harsh police practicing, policing practices. Um, and then also the idea that law um, becomes alienating. 
Um, Monica Bell has uh, talked about legal estrangement. Um, Paul Butler uh, wrote a piece called The White Fourth Amendment. So the law is being perceived as sort of an unjust racialized system to people who are subjected to these practices. Um, I'll say a quick uh, word about risk uh, terrain modeling um, as an alternative way of thinking about um, policing. Um, this draws on work by Leslie Kennedy, Joel Kaplan, and um, Eric Pizza. Um, it's, uh, so risk terrain modeling um, is based on environmental criminology theory that places matter, right? So here I'm not trying to suggest that um, space and place are irrelevant to policing, but just that we need a more uh, a tailored um, way of um, framing the relevance of space. Um, most, even though places matter, uh, most crimes occur in a few places. That's one of the premises of risk terrain modeling. Um, therefore, police should focus on places, not just people to prevent crime. Um, I know here that this is different from the uh, broken windows policing um, from earlier years that focused on offenders rather than physical surroundings. Um, how does risk terrain modeling work? Uh, it's about, it uses both hard data, but it also uh, uses or solicits input from community stakeholders um, who are partners in identifying spatial risk factors. These spatial risk factors can, in, can include things like burned out streetlights, right, that make streets dark and sort of uh, prime them for criminal activity. Um, uh, or vacant housing. Um, and the idea here is that by uh, soliciting the input from community stakeholders who are on the ground and sort of know the spaces that are at risk um, and using hard data, it facilitates a more targeted police response than policing practices like stop and frisk. Um, it also, I should note here, recognizes that geographies are deeply fluid and context dependent, right? So, um, you know, you have to take into account not only the place, but also, you know, the time of um, a day uh, when you're talking about criminal activity. Um, and finally, I think this is my last slide. So a couple quick examples of risk terrain modeling. Um, uh, through this process of using hard data and soliciting community input, um, police in Atlantic City, New Jersey, um, pinpointed convenience stores, laundromats, and vacant buildings um, as places for uh, uh, relatively frequent, frequent drug activity. Um, that led the Department of City Planning to prioritize uh, the remediation of vacant properties to install new lights um, in the area. Um, similarly, a community meeting in Jersey City, um, New Jersey uh, led office, sorry, in a community meeting of, based on a community meeting in, New Jer in Jersey City, um, officers adopted more uh, targeted policing strategies that focused on gas stations uh, that were open 24 hours, seven days a week, rather than just sort of lumping together service stations, gas only stations and gas stations with food marts as they had done previously. Um, as community explained to them that these other kinds of gas stations were not the problem, rather it was these um, gas stations that were open all night every day that were the source of um, criminal activity in the area. So these are just some examples of um, alternative ways to think about um, space and policing in ways that are not um, territorially, racially territorial harmful racially territorial harm, harmful. Um, all right, thank you very much. And I look forward to uh, Q&A and um, uh, additional conversation. Thank you, Professor, uh, Professor uh, Abadi for that uh, excellent uh, contribution. And um, I will now uh, introduce our second speaker, uh, Robert Barkas, who is Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Chicago. Uh, where he is also an affiliate of the Population Research Center, the Committee on Geographical Sciences, and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. He is the author of the book, Wounded City, Violent Turf Wars in a Chicago Barrio, and he will speak to us uh, about police monopoly and the misuse of data during Chicago crime waves, uh, homicide waves. Professor Vargas. Thank you very much uh, first to you know, John and Aziz for the invitation to contribute to this, uh, to this special issue. 
Um, before getting started, I wanted to thank very much my co-authors, uh, Chris Williams, Philip O'Sullivan, uh, Christina Canelo, and uh, the National Science Foundation for the support for this um, for the support for this um, um, uh, for this research. So, the question motivating this study is. Um, how has the city of Chicago responded to its four largest homicide waves in its history? And I wanna quickly talk about the motivation for this question. So I initially uh, set out to do a kind of neighborhood or block level, uh, purely quantitative analysis of homicide trends along the lines of, of, of some of our er earlier panelists. But then I read Elizabeth Hinton's book from the war on crime, from the war on poverty to the war on crime, uh, which, radically altered my thinking. And if you haven't read this book, I highly suggest you you read it. Um, I found it particularly bone chilling because of the, it's, it's part of an argument uh, describing the liberal uh, foundation of what ultimately became mass incarceration. And one key component of her work was the role of liberal social science uh, in generating uh, much of the, the the logics and the policy infrastructure that, that was set up for the expansion of law enforcement. And so I think, so, and so for that reason, um, I find it important both for this study, for the field, when studying uh, neighborhood geographies, uh, city geographies of violence to also couple that with the ways that uh, the state is responding on the ground and, and either heeding or ignoring or manipulating the science in, uh, to inform their interventions. And so by a homicide spike, we refer to a time period when homicide rates uh, increase in successive years and suddenly end. And so just with this basic definition, we, ref we identified four of Chicago's largest homicide waves. Uh, so one in the 1920s, uh, one in the, in the 60s, one, that, one from, the, from 1987 to 1992, and then a fourth, um, in 2016. Um, and then really quickly uh, for the methods, we relied on a variety of archives, uh, newspaper reports, uh, Chicago Police Department's annual reports, uh, some of the same homicide databases that uh, Pat used earlier for his, his quantitative stuff, and then also Freedom of, uh, Freedom of Information Act requests. And so a summary of what we found, uh, in each time period, in terms of the, the city's response, uh, in the 1920s, the story of violent suppression, 1960s of leveraging the civil rights movement and the fear of, of, of black power into police expansion. Uh, somewhat similar story in the 80s with, uh, with, uh, with gangs. And then in 2016, um, uh, a similar kind of response uh, to the black, with the Black Lives Matter movement. I'll get into uh, specifics more of what I mean um, for this talk and then end with some implications. So these are data that we, that we geocoded with in collaboration with uh, librarians uh, at the Newberry Library in Chicago using Lee Beanin's historical homicide database uh, in Chicago. So we're able to actually geo, geotag and aggregate to look at some basic neighborhood trends of homicide uh, during the spike in Chicago in the 1920s. And as you can see, it, it, it kind of moves around a bit. Um, there are periods when it's concentrated downtown, which at the time was um, uh, considered kind of like a vice district where there's a concentration of bars. And then parts in the South side, which is the, the what was called the black belt at the time period, but also in, in other, uh, other parts of the city, uh, particularly some of the white uh, immigrant uh, neighborhoods of the city at the time. So what did uh, city of Chicago do at the time? Uh, so, Mayor Big Bill Thompson, he was named, was known, he was known as, uh, was mayor during the first three, wave, three years of the wave. And if you lived in Chicago at the time, you would not have known that a violent spike was going on because the city didn't respond at all to it. There was virtually no news coverage of it, in part because uh, Thompson historically is known as one of the most corrupt mayors in the city of Chicago's history, uh, in part to his ties to uh, organized crime. And so no one, uh, no, it was the, the government at the time did Virtually, virtually nothing in response to the, this uptick in homicide. Uh, Mayor Dever, however, was uh, elected in 1923, defeated Thompson as a reformer, and pledged to do something about the organized crime problem and the violence of the homicide that came with it. But uh, as we saw from the maps that I showed earlier, the, the problem of homicide was occurring uh, sporadically in different parts of the city. Um, 
Despite this, however, uh, Dever targeted the bulk of his response to the uptick in violence uh, in, uh, the black, in Chicago's Black Belt, which is a stretch of, of South State Street from roughly Roosevelt to 35th Street now. Um, and um, he campaigned in part on um, uh, igniting fears of Black criminality and, pit, and pitting himself as, as kind of like the protector of Chicago and, and labeling Thompson as, um, as a, you know, friends with criminals. And so, um, you know, at the time I feel like, okay, uh, some of us might step back and say, okay, the tools of social science are not as developed in this time period or whatnot. But I think this, this case is really instructive because as you'll see with uh, the waves that we cover later, Chicago actually hasn't gotten very far away from this mode of framing and responding to its upticks in, in, in violence. So wave two happened in the 1960s. Uh, this is a very similar map to what Pat showed earlier. We, are, we aggregated this to community areas in order to compare this with uh, data from the 1920s. Um, and so again, a, a similar story here where year to year it moves around a bit and never really stays in the, same, in the same spot. Although there's some consistencies here with like Loop and Fuller Park. Uh, having the highest rates of homicide during this wave. And in this decade uh, was uh, Richard J. Daly was mayor who is photographed here sitting uh, or, or talking with his police chief, Orlando Wilson. Now, one important thing to remember here is that there, there are many in uh, the philanthropic and, and uh, social scientific world of violence prevention today that claim that you know, the city has not relied on the tools of science to address these issues. And then beginning in the, in the late 2000s, whatever, you know, uh, is when science started, started, to, become, started to, to become taken seriously. Orlando Wilson was uh, former president of the American Society of Criminology and had taken, taken the job as a, a, a Mayor Daley's police chief. Uh, 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 he, um, resigned as Dean of the Berkeley School of Criminology to take this job to reform the, police chief, to reform the Chicago Police Department and assist Mayor Daley. So the relationship between social science and the police department actually goes far, far back than most, I would say most of my colleagues who work in this area uh, um, uh, claim. And in this time period, uh, initially 1965, 66, when, when homicide was starting to peak, uh, Chief Wilson, uh, through the use of the statistics and statistical reports that he was releasing to the public via the Chicago Tribune, uh, actually ignored the initial uptick in homicide and claimed that, you know, overall, the crime rate is declining, so that's okay. This homicide spike is something to not be concerned with. But as the spike continued in successive years and could no longer be something to be ignored, uh, with, with a, an uptick that happened around the same time that civil rights demonstrations and anti-war demonstrations were peaking in the city in 67 and 68. That's when you saw the city of Chicago shift gears uh, toward uh, blaming the lawlessness of activists and civil rights demonstrations, uh, uh, blaming them particularly for this uptick in violence um, and creating an environment where criminals are emboldened. And so in response to this, uh, Daly, who at the time is very deeply embedded in the National Democratic Party, uh, lobbies the federal government and the state government for more funding for police, uh, which he receives, in addition to lobbying for stop and frisk legislation, and then forming these gang intelligence units. And these are the gang intelligence units that ultimately would become um, uh, uh, one of the units that John Burge uh, formed and as, as we all know, uh, uh, wreaked a havoc of torture upon uh, African-Americans in, in Chicago South Side. Wave three from 1987 to 1992, uh, similar kind of story here where year to year while homicide is, is uh, spiking, it's, it's moving around from area to area. To area. Um, but now we're seeing this pattern that, that is consistent with, with uh, some of the earlier uh, presentations of, of the, the violence being concentrated in mostly low income, uh, in majority low income African American uh, neighborhoods. So what did the city do in, in response? So initially uh, the, the police came out and claimed that despite all of this talk of an uptick in homicide, that if you actually compare 
the total number of homicides in Chicago in 1987-88 compared to the total number in the 60s, there's actually, there are actually fewer, uh, fewer homicides. Uh, this is totally ignoring the fact that Chicago's population had increased by, by nearly half, uh, half a million to, uh, to, to nearly a million. But this is kind of the, the, uh, 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 the sense of the logic and the way that data are used by, by the police department. But I would also add uh, the way that they're allowed to get away with these egregious, uh, these egregious um, uh, errors in terms of statistical calculation, uh, both in terms of silence from, uh, from the media and, and, science, and silence from social scientists. Um, and so uh, like previous waves, uh, the, the Daly administration, now this is the son of Richard J. Daly, who, uh, Richard M. Daly, um, similarly uh, blamed the uptick in, in violence on youth gangs, but also um, yeah, um, like his father before him, expressed um, uh, or attributed blame to the uptick in violence to these um, to, to soft approaches to crime. So this is a memorable, well, memorable quote here from Mayor Daly in, in, the, in the late 80s. He said, remember the stories about the social workers complaining, oh, you're picking on the poor kids. He's referring to the, the, the war on poverty in the 1960s. Now, they're 40 year old gangbangers running narcotics, narcotics and they're not afraid of, of me or anyone else. Um, his police chief, Leroy Martin, uh, after a visit to China at the time, uh, praised them for executing drug dealers by firing squad and uh, was quoted by the Chicago Tribune as saying, uh, we need to take a look at the constitution and maybe from time to time we should curtail some of those rights. And the city of Chicago did, in fact, did that. Uh, they, they, the Daily administration passed the, um, uh, an anti-loitering law that was ultimately struck down uh, a few years later by the Supreme Court. But again, uh, what we're seeing here is just a similar pattern of uh, demonizing, uh, particularly uh, um, uh, demonizing black communities, uh, uh, creating uh, policies of punishment um, and really uh, egregiously misusing data and science to legitimize these, uh, these kinds of interventions. Um, wave four, which is just one year, 2016, um, is highly concentrated in Inglewood and Fuller Park. So it's distinct from the other uh, homicide waves. Um, and also distinct in the sense that it was just one year. There were, there were, no, really, there were no successive years, uh, which suggests there's all sorts of different things that are going on in Chicago and these times uh, relative to, to the past. Um, so in 2016, Mayor Rahm Emanuel um, uh, placed blame on this uptick uh, to emboldened criminals. Uh, and in this, he was, he's referencing the increased police scrutiny, particularly in the aftermath of, of, um, of I forget, it was a, of, of Ferguson, right? Because there was a, there was a, a uh, whole speculation and debate over the, the quote unquote Ferguson effect that these demonstrations in response to police violence was taming police officers and therefore um, emboldening criminals to engage in violence thinking that they would get, or get away with it. So the mayor um, and his police chief at the time uh, put out that narrative. But also uh, I think it, to in a fair point also point to the importance of the lack of federal gun control legislation, but also the lack of federal aid to cities, uh, which by this point is, is virtually non-existent uh, as so many uh, urban sociologists have long docu documented. Um, mayor Emanuel is the first mayor of Chicago during a homicide wave to actually consider a non-punitive response to the problem, uh, specifically uh, by introducing a, a privately funded mentoring program called Get In Chicago. And, uh, while the mayor certainly deserves, while Mayor Emanuel certainly deserves credit for this, uh, for, for at least changing the course somewhat, when you look at the budget of this mentoring program, which is thirty-six million dollars, it pales in comparison to uh, CPD's budget of in of that year, which is a four billion dollars. Um, so while we're moving the ne the needle uh, slightly, there's there's still quite a lot uh, that the city has to do uh, differently to, to kind of ba balance that. Um, Mayor, the, uh, Mayor Emanuel also placed 619 more officers onto the streets. And uh, at the end, tail end of this, uh, received some, some funding through private donations to establish strategic decision support centers, uh, which uh, it 
which infused communities with uh, technology, surveillance technologies like ShotSpotter and surveillance cameras in an effort to try and decrease um, uh, research response times to shootings and, and whatnot, uh, which we we're seeing in the news with the result of Adam Toledo's killing by the police, which was triggered by a ShotSpot alert. Um, that these these tech, the the viability and the efficacy of these technologies is uh, becoming increasingly under under question. Um, while um, the, while the focus of this was homicide waves, I, I wanted to alert you all to something that's happening right now. That is a continuation of this history right now, which is the the spike in carjacking that the city of Chicago has been experiencing ever since the beginning of the pandemic. And on the left hand here, um, the Chicago is it's a map produced by the Chicago Tribune of the car, of the quote unquote carjacking problem. And as you can see, the map is incredibly misleading because it creates the appearance that um, that uh, carjacking is happening everywhere. And so the Chicago Police Department similarly showed these maps everywhere, uh, talked to the city council that is saying that this is a problem that's being caused by uh, bored youth who are car are carjacking cars because. Um, uh, to, to engage in joy rides and whatnot. But a, a simple map uh, produced by uh, my data science scientist, Brian Benotti showed that when you just look at basic rates by census tract, it shows that, again, that Chicago's black, uh, predominantly black and brown communities are actually the ones most afflicted by carjacking. This is not a random kind of uh, um, uh, occurrence. But again, what we're seeing here is the same playbook, which is playing to fear in order to justify a punitive response to um, uh, governing low-income communities of color. Um, I have a few minutes left, so I'll get to the, just get right to the implications, or just one important implication. I think it's really important to convey here that like, there's no shortage of social scientists in the Chicagoland area to call out the errors in the Chicago Police Department's use of data. And, through a Freedom of Information Act um, uh, request, I was able to uh, acquire the uh, data user agreement signed between the University of Chicago and the Chicago Police Department um, to, because uh, as some of you may not know, the, uh, the Chicago, the researchers at the Harris School uh, collaborate with the Chicago Police Department and rely on um, and provide uh, data support in a variety of different arenas. And as part of this data sharing agreement, there's a really important, I think, clause here that I'll read to you. It states, nothing in this agreement creates any obligation on the part of Chicago Police Department to provide information. With or without cause, CPD retains the right to require the immediate return or destruction of all copies of the information obtained under this agreement. Take such actions as it deems appropriate to protect the security and privacy of this information and enforce the terms of this contract and refuse any future requests for criminal information from the requester. Now, when I, when I spoke to this with, um, I, had, I had attended uh, an information session on data user agreements at the University of Chicago, where the lawyer had mentioned that the University of Chicago very much values academic freedom and doesn't want to sign data agreements that places constraints upon researchers on what they can publish. And when I brought up whether language, when I asked whether language like this is common in data user agreements, uh, they actually told me it's not. Uh, so stipulations that like the, the agency can take away data at any moment are common. You know, these data agreements are common because of, it, of concerns over confidentiality. But an additional assertion that the agency can bar someone from ever receiving data ever again, kind of goes a little bit further, uh, again, to uh, in some ways disciplining and constraining uh, our researchers. And so um, what are some big picture implications from all of this? So if, we, if we're trying to think about how can we prevent this, how can we move things differently, do things differently? I think ultimately what is at the root of this is this pattern of city leaders governing the city of Chicago through fear, which is catering to your constituency, showing the evidence of policy success by creating a feared other and regulating them and punishing them and creating metrics of punishment in order to show success and, uh, and get votes uh, tallied for you. And th this, uh, Jonathan Simon writes about this, 
Um, this is a tried and true and unfortunately politically effective strategy that I think many view uh, uh, Republicans as being particularly effective at. But uh, in reality, what some of this, some of our research is showing is that this is equally uh, uh, a governing, governing tech, governance tactic apply, that's applied by, by Democrats and folks on the other aisle. Um, I think we need to have some important questions and, and debates over data user agreements and the academic freedom that, that they provide researchers uh, with respect to questions on violence and on police accountability. Um, and you know, I, I, I think I, I wanna also make uh, an important point here because I think so much of the research, so much of the talks today are focused on neighborhoods and geography and blocks. And you know, it's 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 a tradition that comes out of my department, right? The Chicago School of, of Urban Sociology. Um, I would argue that, you know, that 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 work's important. I would argue that I think to, to really make headway in with these problems, I think we actually need to embrace more of the work of Max Weber, uh, who describes the state as having a monopoly on violence. And I think in the 21st century, this age of data that we're living in that this manifests as a monopoly over data and the ability to regulate, control, and discipline who does what with Chicago Police Department data. And this means uh, research enterprises focusing on scrutinizing data systems and data governance um, and stepping into the, into the arena instead of uh, trying to uh, be dispassionate, uh, distanced researchers. And then last slide real quickly, you know, given that this is a law review and the focus is on the law, I think that uh, some other possibilities here for tackling this problem is to consider about consider amending the Freedom of Information Act, uh, because at the end of the day, what CPD is doing, uh, when I've read the legal scholarship that, scholarship on this, is perfectly legal due to the due to the way that the Freedom of Information Act is currently drafted. And so, if this is something we want to seriously curtail, that's something we need to 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 think about. And then lastly, we need, I think we need seriously need more scholarship on regu regulations of public private law enforcement collaborations. Because what we have right now in the city of Chicago is neither a public transparent system nor a private free market. It sits somewhere in the middle, and which means that it's not subject to market competition from other entities that wanna provide public safety, and nor is it uh, subject to transparency by citizens and, and advocacy groups. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Professor Orgas, uh, for that uh, compelling uh, contribution. Um, I will now introduce our final uh, speaker, Wesley Skogan, who is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Northwestern University and also of their Center for Legal Studies and their Institute for Policy Research. He is the author, I believe, of seven books, uh, many of several of which are focused on policing in Chicago and most recently edited volume uh, on policing in France. Uh, his remarks are titled Prospects for Reform, The Collapse of Community Policing in Chicago. Professor Skogan. Uh, thanks to all the Zoomers who are hanging in there for this, uh, for this discussion. Uh, I think it's been terrific so far and I'm looking forward to this afternoon as I'm looking forward to lunch. Uh, so I promise not to get in your way uh, when it comes to lunch. Uh, one of the big debates that's taking place in our time, of course, is, is that of police reform, uh, with much discussion of police reform, uh, but in parallel, much discussion of the limits to police reform and instances of the failure of police reform and of the, the difficulties uh, of police reform. Uh, and certainly the, the difficulties are legion. Uh, uh, often, often, often police reform is stillborn, uh, uh, nothing uh, much comes of it. Uh, um, the, there's a large reservoir of public support for the police. Uh, many programs are simply press releases, something for the chief of police and the mayor to point to. Uh, and chiefs come and go, mayors come and go, uh, but police departments linger on with an org institutional and organizational uh, inertia that's actually quite, quite remarkable. Um, in thinking about this conference, I thought that a, a contribution I might be able to make to this discussion is rather to talk about, about sustaining reform, about keeping reform in business, about pushing it forward and making it a permanent part of the institutional infrastructure uh, of a city. Uh, and I'm gonna take as my example, community policing in Chicago. Um, and so my discussion here is about how community policing in Chicago collapsed. Uh, uh, 
after a 15 year run um, uh, of enormous success, um, there were more than a million Chicagoans showed up on various occasions to attend 55,000 community meetings uh, that were held during the period. Um, I'll talk some about the, some of my survey findings, but the public noticed um, so support for the police and a whole variety of measures went up it went among, black, among black, whites and Hispanics. Fear of crime dropped precipitously. Um, uh, many good things, the city got remarkably cleaner for reasons that I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. Uh, Chicago's program was widely known around the world. Uh, it was routine to run into guys from the Bundeskriminalamt or from the Metropolitan Police of London, wandering around uh, uh, police headquarters, uh, coming to see what was, what was going on. It survived changes in police leadership. Uh, mayors, uh, sits, uh, police chiefs came and went, but, but, but community policing persisted. And then in a relatively short order, it just collapsed. Uh, it howled out, it lost its staff, it lost its activities uh, and nothing happened. Um, so in an era when we're looking for responses to the legitimacy crisis that's facing policing, uh, there's often lots of discussion about community policing. And in fact, at President Obama's uh, Commission on 21st Century Policing, one of their pillars of, of, of police reform was community policing. And a big part of the report calls for the re revitalization of America's community policing programs. Uh, so what happened to community policing in Chicago after a 15 year run, uh, it seems to me continues to be an interesting story uh, even today. Um, and to keep this story on track, I'm going to um, um, number my points uh, and there's about seven of them. So you can keep track of how far you are from lunch. Um, uh, the first major heading is that what happened during this 15 year run was that the country changed and the city changed. Uh, and these had big implications for community policing. The first big change was the one that Pat Charkey and, and talked about this morning, which was this historic national drop in crime. Uh, in Chicago between 1991 and 2004, shootings went down by 70%, that's 70%. Robbery went down by two thirds, murders by 50%. Uh, in my surveys, fear of trying, crime dropped by 50% uh, in the city. Uh, by, the, by, the, by the 2000 senior citizens, people like myself were no more fearful than young people, which was a huge reversal of past trends. Uh, uh, by every measure of crime disorder and recorded crime had dropped precipitously. But CAP, but the community policing in Chicago, uh, known as CAPS, was a police program. And what we found in our research that the, the, the number one driver of participation was concern about crime and neighborhood disorder. Uh, when we surveyed people who came to the beat meetings that were being held every month, uh, uh, their, their number one concern, the reason they were there was because of neighborhood crime. Uh, when we compared people who came to meet meetings with their immediate neighbors because we were taking big neighborhood samples, people were more fearful of crime than their neighbors. Those are the ones who came to, to the beat meetings. And in the aggregate data, the strongest correlation of uh, participation in CAPS uh, was, was, the, was the violent crime rate. This is one reason why participation rates were, were, were substantially higher in Chicago's black neighborhoods than they were anywhere else. Uh, the program by many of the measures I've talked about was most successful in, in the black community. Uh, um, but then uh, crime came down. Crime came down a lot. The first, the first chart is a statistical analysis of the relationship between beat meeting attendance and crime. And it shows very sharply that as crime dropped down, so did beat meeting attendance drop down. Um, in more detailed analysis, the, the decline in crime parallel the, uh, the decline in attendance, even when you divided the city up into various kinds of, of slices, diced uh, uh, sub subgroups, uh, the decline in crime led to a decline in participation, uh, which was very, very, um, very, very, very big, very substantial. Uh, even during a time when the, the program is still enormously vital until about say 2009, uh, thousands of meetings were being held around the city every year, but attendance had dropped very significantly. Uh, so ironically, the decline, the decline in crime was one of the things that led to the, to the uh, declining participation uh, in, Chicago, in Chicago's beat meetings. Uh, you were asking people to come out at night after working hard all day, uh, coming out every night in, in, in the winter as well as the summer. Uh, uh, and, and, and the motive for doing so in a police program uh, start, started to decline. But then strategically at just the moment when 
uh, to, that this decline in attendance that was taking place, and partly I think because of Maduro's satisfaction with what was going on, uh, was that this, the second big thing that happened to the country, which was the Great Recession, uh, starting in 2007 and 2008. Uh, the Great Recession hit, uh, the, which was the biggest economic collapse since the Great Depression, uh, hit city budgets in 2008, because they're always a little slower to respond. Uh, and by 2008, Chicago already had a budget crisis. 2008 was the year that the mayor sold the parking meter money for 99 years. Uh, he then spent the entire amount to, to plug his budget in one year, rather than, rather than increase taxes to pay for it, pay for that hole. Um, and that was it. Then the money was gone for 98 more years. Um, so he had to do other things. And one of them started doing is they, they stopped hiring police officers for, for a couple of years. Uh, in fact, the department shrunk by 1,400 officers. Uh, and when you shrink an organization by 1,400 people, that has consequences. And the, one of the first things to go was the community policing budget, which was originally uh, in the early 1990s, yeah, mid 1990s, 1.3% 1 of the police department budget, which was a lot of money, uh, it, was, it was immediately cut to the bone. Uh, the civilian staff, which paid a very large role in the program, was all laid off. Uh, uh, officers were taken away from the police, from the districts. Uh, the headquarters unit that was monitoring and supervising uh, community policing was disbanded. Um, uh, the, the public meetings that were being held, that, that by this point there had been 56,000 of them, uh, were cut back. They went from monthly to quarterly. Beats were combined together and, meet, and met uh, in, in larger groups. Office and office one one officer would attend. Uh, everything had to having to do with liaisoning between community police and other community groups disappeared as the staff disappeared. Uh, uh, and between 2010 and 2015, attendance went down by 50 by 50 percent. Uh, the second chart I'm going to show you is that people noticed. Uh, I did That's surveys in, in 2003 during CAPS's really high point and followed that up with another survey in 2015, uh, asking the same question, showing that people still remembered CAPS. Uh, over, overall, uh, Chicago's recognition was 87%. Uh, knew what I was talking about in the survey. Uh, when asked if the beat meetings were going on, everybody said no. Uh, so the public noticed, they, they knew about CAPS, but they noticed that the meetings weren't going on. Uh, uh, so that the, the combination of decline in participation due to the decline in crime, then uh, intersecting with the Great Recession and the collapse of staff report for the program were the two big national forces uh, that undercut our community policing. And I, and I might add that in particular, the budget crisis was, the, was a nationwide one. I wrote a paper for President Obama's commission. It was called What Happened to Community Policing? Uh, and it was clear uh, at the time of the commission in 2015 uh, that if you use the internet to, to, to study the country, what was going on in police, police departments everywhere, which was that they'd all cut their community policing programs. They all had virtually disappeared. Uh, everybody said, oh, we're still doing it, but we no longer have special units and we no longer have public meetings. Uh, uh, so this was not Chicago's unique uh, reaction to the budget crisis. It was, it was a countrywide one. Um, other things happened that were more specific to Chicago. Uh, this category is that the pol policing changed and the police department changed. Uh, uh, and both of these also stuck arrows in the back uh, of community policing. Uh, the first was leadership turnover. Uh, the original, um, the, orig the, the original, the uh, original, uh, for formulation of the program was imposed on the police department by the mayor who, who brought it to the city and two police chiefs in a row uh, were very supportive of it. It was one reason why that they were selected as police chiefs. So for the first 11 years, uh, which was a long time in the world of community police chiefing, uh, they, they had support, they had support in city hall. But then for reasons that I detail in my paper, the agenda changed and three chiefs in a row came along who had no investment in community policing whatsoever. I blame one of them on the Chicago Tribune, uh, which, in, which in 2003 created a phony uh, crime scare, uh, created a phony crime wave, uh, which caused the mayor to take his cheapest response, which was to, was to choose a tough talking police chief, uh, was cheaper than doing anything else with the police department. So that's what he did. Uh, and that placated the Chicago Tribune. Uh, but it was one of the reasons why there was turnover um, in, in support at, at, at police headquarters. Uh, uh, under, under, under that police chief and two more, the police department shifted to a ComStat management model, which was numbers driven, uh, uh, plus aggressive stop and frisk, uh, 
uh, especially after 2011. So leadership turnover uh, in police headquarters was important. Um, another important point was the city reorganized its, its service delivery. Um, early in the life of community policing, if you had a problem, you went to your beat meeting, uh, the officers there filled out a form and within 24 to 48 hours, your problem was fixed. Your street light was out, you had rats in the alleys that needed poisoning. Uh, uh, there was graffiti, you were having, there was a lot of noise from a local noisy bar. Uh, these, all, these were all things that were dealt with by Chicago's beat meetings, which took a very broad scope about what community uh, pub what public safety was. Uh, but what happened in the 2000s is that began to shift to 311. It shifted out of uh, the police department, it shifted out of beat meetings. Uh, they no longer heard complaints about these things because you call 311. Uh, the 311 system was good for the city, it was very effective. Uh, uh, they were very effective at pushing around the city bureaucracies to being responsive to city complaints, but it left the police department. And going to beat meetings, one of the big reasons people went was because they could fix a problem uh, if they went to beat meetings. And the beat meetings often discussed things like rats in the alleys and graffiti because the police department knew that they, that the, that they, had, they had to be responsive to what the public was concerned about. Another issue I deal with in my chap in my in my paper is uh, is the support of the for community policing among the rank and file. Um, uh, often it's seen that police programs fail because it's opposed by by police officers. Uh, that it's difficult to get them to do new things to do new things to change their routines. Uh, we think that reform programs can be very popular with the public, but not particularly popularly internal internally. Well, I reported on some surveys I've done to Chicago police officers during this period, including most recently in 2013. And my judgment is that the support among the rank and file was not terrible. Dubious, but not terrible. If you saw my a really great chart showing what police think about community policing, uh, what you would see was, well, if, if, they, if, if, if they were to volunteer, would they volunteer to do this if they wanted one of their opportunities? Well, you know, 56% said maybe. Uh, but when you went down a couple of questions on the scale to, is this really important for the department's strategy for dealing with, with, the, with, with the public in Chicago? 70% said yes. Uh, uh, and I, I talk a little bit about the, about, union, about the union politics with this regard, which is actually very favorable. Uh, during the first decade of the program, uh, uh, they actually had the support of members of the executive board of the, of the union. Uh, union elections were fought with nobody ever mentioning community policing as an issue. Uh, the policing, police unions at, those, at that time stuck to bread and butter issues. Uh, there were vocal supporters of it. Uh, and the chiefs that were, that were responsible for the first 11 years of the program were actually quite popular with the rank and file, which probably helped a lot. Then the final point, um, uh, community policing lost, lost its place in City Hall. I talk about the, about the mayor wearing out, losing his focus. Uh, Earlier, uh, there had been status meetings every month uh, held at, at police headquarters in, at, at, at City Hall. The mayor would bring in the top police officials and everybody who was involved in, in, in managing it. My evaluation team was there to give our feedback on what we, what we thought was going on. Uh, uh, and this, this continued until about, about 2000. But after about 2000, the mayor's attention turned elsewhere and I talk about that. Uh, and by about the time the economy collapsed, he was visibly tired and getting ready to leave. And in fact, he did. Uh, his replacement by Rahm Emanuel, of course, was the final spike in the heart of community policing. Uh, Rahm Emanuel came into office pledging to add a thousand police uh, uh, and was a fervent supporter of, the, of his new police chief stop and frisk policy, which led to, for example, in 2014, uh, 718,000 stops in the city of Chicago, way above anything that ever happened in New York. Uh, so the agenda changed. It became one of stop and frisk and Comstat, um, and community policing was was buried. So in some, I would say, you know, the, the country changed, and, and crime plus the Great Recession uh, was really important. I'd say the Great Recession was certainly uh, the number one uh, uh, factor behind the, the collapse of community policing. Number who two was when City Hall lost its focus, uh, and when new police chiefs brought in by City Hall lost that focus. Uh, and the leadership was no longer behind it. It started to spin its wheels. And whenever there was a chance to steal some resources from it, they did. Uh, the mayor stepping down and bringing in a new mayor with no experience in municipal administration and no experience in, in policing, he relied on his police chief that he brought in from New York. 
Uh, they didn't do community policing, uh, neither did his new police chief. Uh, and that was the final straw. In the paper, I'm thinking about how much I want to wax on about what's happened after the collapse of community policing, because it's a, it's a plenty juicy story uh, with, lots of, with lots of, I think, interesting detail. Uh, but community policing in Chicago is, while not dead, is on uh, uh, life support, um, is actually showing some, um, some, 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 somewhat of a renaissance. Following the shooting of Laquan McDonald and the other pleasantries that took place in Chicago, uh, starting in 19, uh, starting in, uh, in 2016, there have been that period. There's been three new chiefs of police, uh, uh, yet another new mayor, uh, uh, and uh, the, the fair amount of resources has gone into restarting community policing and bringing it up to speed. It ran into the COVID like everything else, and believe me, community policing is hard to do when you can't meet with people. Um, uh, so we're going to have to watch and wait and see about the, what this renaissance in community policing might look like. But the city was certainly struck by the legitimacy crisis and certainly knows it has a legitimacy crisis and is looking again, I think, to community policing for how to fix it. So the next time you do this conference, there may be some report about the, about the renaissance of community policing, that sort of post-collapse period where maybe in the search for legitimacy and the need to do something, uh, we return again uh, to the solution of the early 1990s. Uh, which was community-oriented policing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Skogan, um, for that uh, informative uh, contribution. Um, let me now open the remainder of our time until 12.30 um, p.m. Uh, lunchtime um, for questions uh, from, uh, from, from anyone. Um, you can uh, raise your virtual hand. Uh, you could... Uh, use the chat function to send me a question. Um, I'd be, uh, so, so yeah, let me begin with uh, Robert Sampson. Thanks for a great panel. Um, very provocative, um, I have several thoughts. Uh, sort of a, a question that cuts across all three, but um, I think it was uh, provoked by uh, Professor Vargas's uh, statement on, on Weber, uh, which is interesting um, on sort of state monopoly I want to ask a question about that in the sense of monopoly on what? It seems like the monopoly you describe is fundamentally about the control of the narrative. Um, but you're also arguing about data, I think. And I, I wonder if you would agree that the implication here isn't that we really need more vigorous analysis uh, of the social production of crime rates, if I can put it that way. In other words, the mechanisms that are actually producing what are eventually published that start with an, an incident or a report of an incident, and then how that gets um, you know, produced as public information. And the reason I ask that is because it seems to me it complicates the story a little bit more in two ways. One, we know from a lot of research, including ethnographic research and citizen police encounters, going back to classical work, for example, by Donald Black, in the 60s that most encounters of the police uh, with citizens occur uh, based on citizen initiated you know, calls. So in other words, the, the citizens are, are critically involved in the production of crime rates in some um, fashion. And that sort of, what they were really interested in were the mechanisms that, that led to an arrest. But of course, in part, it's also about how it leads to some indication officially that there is an event. Um, the other thing which I think is fascinating is that, it, and this is recent, really, in the last 10 years or so, is the massive um, public nature of data. I mean, right now in the Chicago data portal, pretty much almost instantaneously, at least the next day, incidents um, are now on the, the portal that the public can, can map. You have addresses, you know, where property crimes occur. So those are sort of algorithmic in a sense. They're, they're computerized, they're going up. There's not really, a, there's not much of a filter as I understand it. So the fact that citizens now have more control over the information, the public now that, that is to say, can go and can analyze this data, produce their own maps, can challenge the narratives. And if you think about the narrative that the city has tried to impose or did try to impose about police killings, that was challenged and dismantled by the public. Um, and so 
I'm, I guess my question is about sort of the, the, the bottom up, um, cause your description or at least analytic frames seem very top down, right? Which is appropriate, but isn't it really more the interaction of the two? Or at least my, that's my question because so much of what's happening, um, it seems like you didn't leave enough room for, for the challenging of that, th those narratives, but also the, the availability of the public to analyze the very same data and come to alternative conclusions. For example, the, the carjacking, which in fact, <laughs> I love that map you showed that said, hey, but wait a minute, it's actually not uh, what is said. Uh, is that linked to the fact that so much of the official interactions um, and, and the way incidents come to be have to do with, with citizen calls. And it relates to the last presentation for Professor Skogan on 311 calls. Now every, every city um, pretty much has these. So much of the volume, so much of the uh, demand. So I'm, I'm basically asking about the, this, the citizen demand function, if you will, um, and how that fits into it, coupled with the explosion in the public nature of data. And, and I guess I'm sensitive to that because when I was first studying, like plotting where, where do homicides occur, I had to go through torturous <laughs> uh, means to just get homicide data. And this not that long ago in the 90s, 2000s, it was not public. You had to go through all kinds of agreements. Now you can do it in an instant. So anyway, I just appreciate any thoughts you have on anyone on the, on the panel, although um, the, the state monopoly um, kind of, uh, I, I thought initially of, of you, Robert. Sure, I'll be, uh, I'll be sure with this, because I want to be mindful of time. So to the question of monopoly on what, the way I think of it is it's a monopoly over the questions you can investigate. Because while it's true that certain data are available, the raw aggregate data of all of the entry points of where police officers enter into an arrest card or a report card, those raw data are not posted publicly. And that's really important. And I'll give you uh, a one example of this, which is um, right now at this moment, a very simple way to assess the degree to which carjackings are economically motivated would be to get a sense of what percentage of the cars have been recovered. Because the narrative that CPD has put forth is that these are young people engaging in, in, in joy rides and they don't know how to drive cars and then the car gets recovered. Well, tell us, show us the data of the number of percentage of cars that have actually been recovered. And they haven't shared that at all because they are trying to maintain a framing that this is a youth problem, despite the fact that they're basing this off of information of just 15% of arrestee of, of folks who have uh, perpetrated carjacking. So you get what I'm saying here, that it's, 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 it's a, but at the same time, I agree with you that um, I feel like Weber's notion of monopoly is quoted just pretty regularly when I think it's actually, it's, it's much more of a social dynamic that I think sociolo organizational sociologists need to take up more in the context of, of data. So it's, I think it's a total open question that we need more research on. But, I, but all of this gets to some classic organizational theory paradigms of the performance of organizational effectiveness. And in this case, it's the perfor potential performance of, of public transparency. I don't know if any other panelists uh, would well, like to. I'd like to just, just pick up a little bit on, again, on, on Rob's point is that there, you know, there, there is continuing contestation uh, over this. This is not something that civil society has taken laying down and it's won some significant victories. The original Chicago Police Department strategic subjects list had a spike driven through its heart by public discontent, dissatisfaction, lawsuits and activism. Uh, their attempt to form a replacement gang member database um, uh, is, is mired, is totally mired down in, in opposition and complexity and, and, and lawsuits and um, um, d people being dubious about whether this is a worthwhile thing to do. Uh, the d d debate over uh, the creation of a, of a public uh, police shootings database uh, is one where the, the inspector general uh, for the city of Chicago has taken the warpath um, against the city, along with city aldermen, to try to force the city to open such a database to create it, um, so that it's it's you know this these are not 
this 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 data universe that, that Rob Sampson has been talking about uh, is 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 widely known publicly. The city is filled with data journalists. Uh, if you want to know where people are start who, where their cars are towed on snow day when it doesn't snow, data journalists have come up with big reports on that. If you want to know where people are getting 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 uh, citations for bicycling offenses, that's, I'll tell you where. Uh, in Englewood, they're getting citations for uh, bicycling offenses. Uh, uh, you can find all these things, and data-driven journalism are producing reports all this all the time. So uh, the transparency here, it's, it's, it's not like this stuff is, is, is hidden. This stuff leaks out and is being analyzed and reported really all over the place. Let me call on another questioner, Adam Davidson. Hi, so I, so I, I really appreciate all of your presentations. They're very fascinating. Um, this is, I think, motivated by uh, Professor Body's presentation most, but sort of everyone's really, because I'm trying to, Think of how we put together, I guess, the dichotomy between the criticisms of the use of the, the, the label of, of high crime neighborhoods with what seems to be the empirical reality of crime being very concentrated in particular neighborhoods, especially in Chicago. And so I suppose one way I could, I, I've tried to sort of Put these together is that maybe police are just getting it wrong. Maybe they're just using high crime neighborhoods as a proxy for race or economics. But if that's the case, then I don't see why we couldn't just say, oh, you just have to teach the police which high crime neighborhoods are actually high crime neighborhoods. Um, and if we do sort of match up the, the labeling with the empirical reality, and we say, we still don't want them to use these, this, uh, this label for whatever reason. I, I suppose I'm, I'm wondering what that reason should be. And maybe it's just that this is coming as a result of you know, decades of disinvestment and segregation along racial and ethnic, ethnic lines, but uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I can start and, and, and thank you for the question. So, um, and unfortunately, I did not share my screen when I thought I was sharing my slides. So you couldn't see all the really great slides that I had that would answer your question. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, no, that's my fault. So I wasn't, I wasn't um, trying to contest, and I, I um, thought I had said this, I wasn't trying to contest um, the use of space as a relevant factor in policing activity. Um, when I was uh, sort of the, the Grunwald and Fagan study, you know, what it suggested was that sort of the, the designation of high crime areas was um, too broad and did not align with the actual crime rate. And so I think the point here is about um, the amount of discretion that we invest in police, sort of uninterrogated discretion that we invest in police. Um, and your point about let's just make them aware of um, where the crime is is well taken, although there's some indication that in New York City, under the stop and frisk program, that they were that police were using the high crime designation as a cover for uh, stops that were probably unconstitutional in some respects. Um, so when I um, when I talked about risk terrain modeling, what I was really trying to emphasize is that there are ways to take space into consideration that are more tar targeted and and also uh, rely on community input and data. So I think there are ways to do it. It's just that the high crime area designation because of the level of discretion that has been um, vested in police officers through Wardlow and through other cases um, uh, means that that is not, um, does not align with actual crime. I just wanna add, make one quick comment in response, tips on a lot of themes, which is that I would really hi highly recommend reading Sarah Brain's book, uh, it's, I forget the, the, the title of it, uh, Predict and Surveil, which is on use of LAPD's uh, use of big data and these sorts of things. And I think Wes could probably agree with this, that like the, the way that data and science is, is used in police departments is, is messy. And the technologies that are used come and go. Like one year they're focusing on this and this technology. And then funding runs out for that one. The federal government grant runs out for that one. Then they move on to the next thing. And then they move on to the next thing. And so I don't think it's uh, a case of, you know, some 
police chief sitting on a tower controlling in this top-down story of like, oh, we're going to control the, it's, I think it, it's really ad hoc, but it, part of it is, and this is what Sarah Brain's argument is, is that it's, it's being driven by, uh, in part by the private sector. And this is why um, the calls for reform uh, fall on the deaf ears of abolitionists, because the reform is just the next technology. It's the next government program. And the, and, the, and the police always have kind of like the advantage of being the ones as the gatekeepers of the data. So that by the time someone can call it out, then 10 years later, we're back where we are and then the cycle continues and continues. Uh, let me call on um, R. Del Rio. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, this is a great panel. I'm Richard Del Rio from uh, FSU, Florida State University College of Medicine. Um, so my only, I, I don't so much have a question, actually it's a question and, and a comment. Um, if uh, Robert Vargas could elaborate a little bit more, I, I didn't catch that part where you talking about the questions that, that the police weren't willing to provide data for. And uh, the comment regarding uh, monopoly of data, um, one thing I just wanted to mention was a common strategy of of partnerships between uh, municipal authorities and nonprofit entities, um, which use can kind of be used as a shield, where there's kind of a middleman, a designated middleman for the data, that then uh, serve as a gatekeeper, and that's it. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, just really quickly, I would say things like um, um, the like body camera footage or the, the immediate. Uh, release of, you know, of uh, use of force, or even data on where uh, police officers patrol. Like uh, I've always been curious uh, to uh, be able to spatially map the routes that police officers take on their cars uh, to see where they're actually legit legitimately patrolling in order to assess uh, questions concerning citizen contact with police. But again, we can't investigate that because we don't have access to those data and the field and the folks that do have access to those data often are required to sign these very constrained data agreements. Let me just say that the district commander would sure like to know where his cars are going to. Your, your lack of information about that, 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 that problem is, is legion. Uh, but, but you can, you, you, you get everything about the about destinations from the 911 center. I mean, there's, a, there's 6 million citizen calls to the 311 center every year. They dispatch about 40% of them. Uh, and it's a flood of data that tells a lot, a lot about a lot. Let me call my colleague Aziz. I thank you very much for a terrific panel. I have a question for Elise and a question for Rob. The question for Elise is, imagine there was a, a kind of computerized version of, of the stop forms that are presently used in Chicago, New York, other places, where the field for high crime neighborhood uh, automatically populated uh, based upon data that the city uh, was gathering. Uh, would that solve your, uh, uh, address your concerns? Uh, and if it would, what kind of crime data would be, uh, do you, in your view, would be salient for that? The question for Rob is, um, you, you focus on the availability of data uh, and you focus upon the production of data. Um, the, 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 the hypothesis that I would offer as a counter to that is what matters is not the production of data, but the capacity to um, analyze it. And those two things are completely different. Um, and the, uh, it's not at all clear that the increase in the availability of data um, is correlated to the increase of the capacity uh, within uh, either the CPD or, or police departments generally, maybe LAPD and brain study is an exception, uh, to actually use the data. Uh, so, so I wonder if you could say something about the relationship between production and uh, processing. So I guess um, I can go first. Um, so, so if there if there were a, sort of a computerized, if there's computerized data that allowed um, uh, police to identify where uh, high crime areas were and, and the nature of crime in those areas. I mean, I think that would be an argument for um, um, having a, a little bit more, uh, I don't want to use the word trust, um, but at least a, a way for verifying the integrity of police stops, you know, and the question of how that 
sort of um, examination of police stops would be carried out, um, you know, is is an open question. And I know, you know, I suspect my panel, co-panelists, have thoughts about that. Um, I don't. Uh, I mean, I, I suppose my sort of main intervention here is to sort of sort of challenge the constitutional. Um, landscape that has been created through the Wardlow decision and the sort of inordinate vesting of discretion in the police. I think that, you know, as I was indicating before, um, I don't sort of mean to challenge the um, possible, the possibility of higher efficacy through uh, narrower uses of spatial data, but just that right now we have, um, you know, a sort of a legal system that gives police too much authority. I mean, you know, if I could imagine a different world where police had access to data and then appropriately relied on it in accordance with the nature of the, um, or the kind of crime um, that, they're, uh, that they're trying to uh, check, um, then, you know, I think that would be, you know, wonderful from my, uh, from my perspective. Um, but I guess my sort of bottom line is is just that we also need to rein in the level of discretion um, that police have in the absence of the kind of institutional interventions that you're describing. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'll um, try to quickly answer to say uh, it's a great point, Aziz. Um, when I think about the capacity to analyze, you know, um, so. Lisa just mentioned like imagine. So if I can imagine like uh, having a magic wand, I would be investing a lot of money in training folks in communities of color in data analysis, uh, in coding uh, to uh, develop that capacity uh, um, uh, to contest narratives or to construct their own. And um, that uh, capacity I would say is there because having done field work in these communities, I can tell you that just growing, you can't grow up in Little Village without having a mental map of where are the most violent areas you know, surrounding you, where, where can you go for safety? So like the capacity is there. I think it's just a matter of uh, rethinking the character, the characteristic uh, of capacity um, because I don't think it's, uh, it's the way that we kind of think it in the academic sense of, of elite training and that and, and whatnot. Uh, but I would also add, you know, a, a, another layer of complexity to what you said that a, a, what, what complicates it too, uh, in terms of why availability isn't the solution is that also, it's also the ability to make this discernible to the public, let alone policymakers, right? The, 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 so the, the average citizen's scientific literacy is, is low in the US relative to, to similar countries, right? Let alone, let alone with our policymakers. So that is, is in a, in a, an additional um, layer to this that uh, I think we need more thinking about. Well, thank you, uh, Professors uh, Body, Vargas, and Skogan. I have questions and comments for all of three of you, but I'm going to end this. I will just email you separately. I'm going to end this uh, on time. And uh, the third panel then convenes at, uh, at in an hour at 1.30. So, Thank you so much. This has been wonderful.